Yeah, I'm going to boogie a little bit so we can make sure we finish this lecture. Um, I'm going to boogie a little bit so we make sure we finish this lecture, okay? So injury, cell injury effects and responses, reversible, irreversible changes, or death. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. So reversible changes. So some things that can happen is alternative metabolism. What is metabolism, guys? Do you remember the general gist of it? There are two. That's okay. You can tell me. I, I want to know. Okay. So metabolism is comprised of two major functions. Catabolism. I'm going to bring you guys out to the screen here. Okay. Catabolism. So metabolism is going to be how quickly or slowly things function in our body, okay? So metabolism is going to be generally comprised of um, anabolism, or I could put, say anabolic, that might look more familiar, okay? And catabolic, okay? So if a cell gets damaged, we can alter its metabolism. Okay, it's ability to either build things up or break things down. Now, if I were to go out and pump some anabolic steroids into myself, what would I look like? Right, get really big. My little two-year-old, I keep trying to, because I teach nutrition and dietetics, I'm training to be a health coach. So I'm trying to teach them about food, right? And so I'll say to him, I'll give him his milk or, you know, like ham or protein of some sort. And I'll say, ooh, let's see your muscles. And he goes, ooh, <laughs> he makes that face. So, right, so anabolic steroids, I'd be building things up, okay? Anabolism or anabolic references to metabolic physiological functions that build structures up. So it could be the bones, it could be the muscle, it could be the creation of stored energy. Okay, anything that builds molecules together, anabolism, okay? So if we're building up, catabolism is going to do what? Break it, down. break it down. Why would we want to break stuff down in the body? Release energy. To release energy, to reform structures, okay? Regenerate cells. They say every seven years you rebuild a new liver, okay, so yeah, is that cool? So, okay, so reversible changes is a change in the metabolism of that cell. It's slowing down, mo most likely, rather than speeding up, okay, but if the cell can get back to its normal homeostatic state, it can be a reversible change, okay? So altered metabolism. Let me just read through this really quick to make sure. We talked about oxygen and glucose creating energy, okay? If there's a lack, you'll move into what's called anaerobic mechanisms, which is going to use fat. We'll get into this in the future, okay? So the change of metabolism, okay? So the takeaway from this is anabolic, catabolic, okay? We need those mechanisms to create energy and to store it forms and then to break it apart. If we don't have enough glucose and oxygen, we're going to move into fat burning. That's the whole premise behind South Beach and and um, what's the other one? Yeah, help me, Atkins. Thank you. Okay, as you move into that fat burning stage, because fat is going to be our secondary source of energy. Okay, so just a brief introduction about metabolism and that altered size. Okay, we talked about the size and the shape of the cells have to be a certain size or a shape for them to function properly. Okay, so are we familiar with these terms? Hypertrophy is going to be when a cell gets bigger. Hyperplasia is when we get more cells. Atrophy is when a cell shrinks. Okay, what else do I have there? Apoptosis is programmed cell death. That's one of the other backup plans if we have those free radicals attacking cells in the body. Okay, our cells have a genetic code that if they sense they're becoming too abnormal, they undergo apoptosis and they kill themselves. Okay, pretty cool. But sometimes it goes awry, right? And that's when we get into the cancer. And why does it go awry? If you could tell me, we'd be worth a trillion dollars, right? Okay, and that's where the research goes with cancer is where that change, why don't they undergo apoptosis? Why do they convert to cancerous? So, okay, so 
cell size changes. Let's practice. Let's do this all together so we make sure we get through everything. Enlarged heart due to atherosclerosis would have undergone which of those cellular changes? My people at home, I'm going to bring you in. Okay. So do we create and get rid of more heart <coughs> cells? Do you guys know that? No, we can't generate more heart cells. That's the problem when we have a myocardial infarction. Mm -hmm. Those cells cannot be regenerated or gotten rid of and then regenerate new heart cells, okay? So that being said, do we get enlarged heart? Sure, we've seen it. Well, maybe not seen it, but, you know, on studies have seen it. I've seen it. It's amazing. In cadaver dissections, if somebody has hypertrophy of their heart, you expect a nice little fist-sized heart, and you open up that chest cavity, it's like, wow. I saw one that was all the way over to uh, the lateral ribs, just huge, huge. Okay, so hypertrophy is going to be the answer. <laughs> Darn it, I hate it when I do that. Okay, so hypertrophy will be the answer for that. Cancer cells are in all of us. Did you know this? Okay. okay. Why don't we present with that cancer then? Our body fights it off, okay? Our body will recognize those cells and get rid of them. Luckily, they don't always hurt us due to what? Cell process, apoptosis, or that programmed cell death, okay? When it, we've all seen this. You could bang this an answer out in your sleep probably. When a patient wears a cast, quite often their muscles will undergo atrophy. And then what happens? They get the cast off, unless, unless they have a permanent deformity. They get the cast off and that muscle grows back. That's that altered metabolism. Those cells are not being used. They slow their metabolism down and in doing so, the cells will shrink. When they get the cast off, they start to undergo rehab and those cells will grow, okay? When a callus forms, these cells are undergoing hyperplasia, okay? Perfect, let me give you an example. When I was getting my doctorate, I had 24 credits a trimester. So I went all year round with a one week break between each trimester. And I would have 24 to 27 credits. It was a lot. And my pinky, I'm right handed, my pinky was like, shh, it was like sticking out an inch on the joint because of the hyperplasia, you know? Because my body set, and it, got, it would get red and sore, it was crazy because I constantly would drag it across the paper while I took my notes. And then you get stressed and you do what? You push like harder, right? Because the teacher's going so fast. You're like, oh, I'm never gonna keep up with this class because they wouldn't give us the notes. We just, you just took your notes and off they went and it was crazy. So that is my hyperplasia story, <laughs> okay? But we get a lot of these on our feet in different areas where we have abrasion, okay? So reversible change, some um, more, uh, intracellular, okay, reversible changes. So we talked about the cells themselves and how the size of the cells can change, okay, and the amount of the cells can change. These are changes in the cell itself. We can get hydrophic change, which is going to be the influx of water, okay. Now once again, that's going to change that size and shape of that cell. Is that going to be a good permanent thing for that cell? No, it's going to have to go back to its normal state in order to function properly. Okay, the protein pumps that are in that cell membrane kick it <laughs> or die or don't function properly, okay? And you could get an influx of water. Where this is, the good example of this happening is if somebody has a deficiency of blood supply to the cells, okay? Those cells that are not getting a good blood supply are not gonna function properly. Those protein pumps that are in that cell membrane will not regulate the fluid going in and out of that cell, and sodium will start to leak into the cell, and water starts to leak into the cell, and they start to get bigger, okay? Now, if blood supply is restored in an appropriate amount of time, those protein pumps can kick back in and fix it, okay? If it's not, they're going to lice and break open, okay? So hydrophic change is gonna be the influx of water because of the influx of sodium, where sodium goes, water goes. Fatty change, okay? This, we're gonna see, a good example is the liver, okay? People who are chronic alcoholics, okay? That chronic intoxication, okay? We can also have this fatty change in the heart if you have blocked coronary arteries, 
those cells cannot metabolize the fat and get rid of it, and fat will start to build up in the cells. Um, I think I've seen this once or twice, but there's a gentleman that I listen to, Dr. Cisaldo. He's on iTunes. He is brilliant. And he talks about, and I'm pretty sure that I've seen this, people who have a very fatty liver upon dissection, if you were to actually pull their liver out, and I, I think I remember seeing this once or twice, it's slippery. <laughs> Those cells are full of fat so much that it starts to leak out into the extracellular compartments. Okay, so that fatty change is happening due to some sort of intoxication to the liver. We would see the same thing in the heart if there was a lack of blood supply to some of those heart cells. Okay, so fatty change is going to be the depositing of fat into those cells and those organs because they are not healthy and they can't get rid of that fat. Residual bodies, these are actually called lipofusion granules, okay. It's when parts of the cells in the cell membrane, so normally we talked about those lysozymes, okay? Those little bag of enzymes that are inside of cells will usually go to cell components that are being broken down and restored, okay? So the cell membrane around a cell is old and tired. It needs to be regenerated. Part of it will break off, and usually those lysozymes will eat it up and break it down into carbolipids and proteins and get rid of it. Okay, lipofusion granules is when the cells, and this happens in all of our cells as we get older. You know, our cells, just like me, get tired <laughs> as you get older, and they don't function as properly. They can't break down those cellular components as well, and you could see them as lipofusion granules, little fatty deposits in the cells. Okay, there's going to be more dominant in cells that are injuries, injured as well. Okay. Um, Alzheimer's has residual bodies seen in the central nervous system. Why would this change their mental state? If there are residual bodies in those neurons, why would it change them? Do you guys remember how neurons function? They send messages. Okay, action potential. Does that ring a bell? Okay, action potential. We'll get into that in central nervous system. It's how we send messages down nerves, okay, both ways, into the brain and out of the brain, okay? Those residual bodies are going to intercept those signals, aren't they? So they aren't going to move as well as they should back and forth, okay? Highland change is seen with non-specific injury. Do you remember highland cartilage? You don't, you don't remember highland cartilage? Highland cartilage is going to be like um, between the ribs and the sternum, um, in the nose, on the ends of joints. It's smooth cartilage, um, especially when you look at it microscopically, it looks very smooth. That's located in different areas of the body. Well, hyaline change is going to be something that looks, it's not hyaline, it looks like hyaline microscopically. That's why it's called hyaline change. And once again, it's just going to be a byproduct of the inability of that cell to get rid of substances. Okay? So different changes inside the cell of substances that will make the cell a little less efficient. Okay. Are we good with that? Do we have any questions? All oh, my people at home, I didn't check the emails. I'll check them at the end of class, okay? Okay, so reversible changes. So what would cause fat, fatty change in a heart attack? I told you this, but just so we emphasize it. What would cause fatty change? What type of damage would cause fatty change in a heart? lack of, of blood supply or oxygen. And which fatty change would cause chronic hepatitis out of those cell damages that we talked about in intoxication? Good. Okay. Irreversible injury, it's irreversible because that's it. The cell is gone. Okay. So the cell maintain normal function. If irre will, it, will it maintain normal function? No. Right? Okay, so if not normal function, what happens to the cell membrane? Okay, what's the whole premise of the cell membrane? Is to be very selective in what gets in and out. Sodium will flow in, and then what follows sodium? Water. The other big ion that'll sneak in there is calcium. Okay, calcium likes to clog up everything in the cell. It likes to get into those channels that make protein, okay? It'll inhibit the ability of that cell to replicate or duplicate itself, okay? It's very damaging to the cell, okay? 
Now, you could also get deposition of calcium into cells that doesn't cause as much damage, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. The nucleus, the DNA is not going to function properly. The endoplasmic reticulum, make a note of this, is what's going to help to create proteins. If this is not functioning properly, we can't create proteins. Normally, I'm going to ask you all these questions. You guys are lucky today because we got to zip through because we're getting to the end of class. Those lysosomes are not going to function properly. Those lysosomes are those bag of enzymes. Okay, They'll just start to break open and release the enzymes to the cell and to the external environment. And then the mitochondria is going to create what? Energy. So if that's not prop uh, functioning properly, you're not going to create the proper amount of energy. Okay. So irreversible death is when all of these organelles or these tiny organs lose these functions. Does anybody need me to review any of those? Okay. Okay. Good. Death, uh, cell death or necrosis, or there's different types of necroses. This probably looks familiar. Does this look a little bit familiar, some of these? So different things can happen to the cells as they start to die. Okay. Different things can happen to the cells as they start to die. Or they can move through varying um, steps of these necroses. Coagulation necrosis is going to be the first step. And if you look at a picture of cells that are undergoing coagulation necrosis, you won't see their organelles inside of them anymore. They'll lose their nucleus, they'll lose their endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, all of those organelles start to get digested by the lysozymes. But you could see the cell membranes. You could still see those cells. You could see almost like a shadow of what that tissue should have looked like. Okay. KC is necrosis, excuse me. <coughs> it's a variation of that. <coughs> Have you guys ever dealt with caseous necrosis? This is kind of antiquated. Okay, let me tell you why. Because caseous necrosis is actually affiliated with TB. Okay, so we don't see that unless we're looking at immune compromised patients. Although there have been some, there were a few outbreaks a year, a couple years ago. I forget where that was, of TB. But we don't see this as more for a couple reasons. Okay, because it's not as prevalent as it used to be, and it's also treated very easily with antibiotics, right? Okay, but caseous necrosis looks cheesy. If you take a lung with somebody who has TB and you cut through it, it it's, I know, it's gross, but <coughs> it looks cheesy. Okay, gangrenous necrosis, you're probably familiar with this, right? You get a bacterial infection into that dying tissue, it manifests and it starts to grow. Could be either liquidy or could be dry. Okay, so gangrenous necrosis. Liquefaction necrosis is going to be those cells turning into, am I going too fast? Okay, those so cells turning into liquid, we see this in the central nervous system in the brain. This is where this shows up, okay, liquefaction, necrosis. And calcification isn't, I, you know what, now that I look about at this, I don't know why this is lumped into necrosis. Calcium moving into cells can kill them, but we can also get a small deposition into cells that does not kill them. If you have a patient who has a joint injury of some sort, a lot of times they'll have, if it's prolonged and intense, calcification in the surrounding tissues. Your body does that because what your body's trying to do is stabilize that area. There's a damage there, some funky's going on. I don't know how to control it, so what am I going to do? My body puts calcium there in an effort to try to stabilize it, okay? So calcification can cause death of tissue, but also keep in mind that we can have deposition of calcium into tissue without killing off that tissue, okay? So it's kind of a weird place to put that now that I look at that, okay? So what type, can we hit the overhead lights and let's move this through this together? <clears throat> Thank you so much. What type of necrosis is this? Now this is kind of tough. Think about the different types we talked about. We talked about gangrenous. We talked about caseous. We talked about coagulation. We talked about calcification. And I'm missing one. Am I missing one? Gangrenous. Okay. This is, I know this is tough. What do you think this might be? Do we see some sort of cells here? This is probably a big review for you. I'm going to tell you this one <laughs> because I think, I think that you could figure it out if you saw the other ones and then go back to this. This is going to be coagulation. OK? 
okay? This is gonna be coagulation. These are kidney tubules. If you look at the upper, as you're looking at the screen, the upper right, you could see the circles, okay? Those circles are all kidney tubules. And along those circles are cells which have lost their nuclei and organelles. And they just look like little empty cells now, okay? So I know this one's hard. But if we move on to this one, there it is, okay? That's caseous necrosis. And you can see it looks cheesy, okay? This is cheesy. And once we go through all of them and you look back at that first slide, you'll see the difference. You'll be able to see which one it is. Okay, this is caseous necrosis. What was the first one again? Um, coagulation. Okay. Yep, no problem. <clears throat> so first of all, what tissue are we in here? Brain. Yeah, this is gonna be the brain. So which one did I tell you manifests in the brain? Liquid. Li liquefaction, okay, yep. So we, have, we probably have had some sort of stroke here and that reddish area is going to be liquefied material, okay? It's gonna have a liquid type of consistency. So this is liquefaction. We got this, right? This is gonna be gangrenous, okay? This is gonna be gangrenous. When I um, prep this course and I look, you know, because I really like putting examples up, wow, you can't believe the stuff that I see that happens to people. Maybe you guys do, maybe you deal with a lot of it, but mama mia. Poor people, okay? So, now, th this is hard to see. Oh, it's easier up on the overhead board. What type, oh, where is the dystrophic calcification? Can you see it? Where are we, first of all? Where? where? In the ankle. I thought somebody said the brain. In the ankle. No, not the brain. No. Ankle. And where's the calcification? I think somebody's saying it. Achilles tendon, okay? Very often people can get an Achilles tendonitis and they perpetuate whatever um, uh, activity they're doing, you know, runners, whatever. And it'll turn into what's called a tendinosis, which is damage to that tendon. And that tendinosis quite often will calcify. And they'll get calcifications into that Achilles tendon, okay? And you can see on the far, if you're looking at the screen on the far right, you know, right at the tip of the heel, I'm trying to tell people at home, looking up, you could see little dots and that's the calcification, okay? So if we here look out here, okay? That's the calcification, little dots of white, okay? So atherosclerosis, atherovessel sclerosis hardening, this is a whole process that we will go through of how this happens on a microscopic level. So we're looking at a transverse section of a vessel, okay? And you can see that there is a thickening on that bottom part, okay? So there's two vessels there. That bottom vessel is the one we're looking at. You can see that there's a thickening there. So what's happened there is there's been a damage to the inside of that vessel, which is attracted um, macrophages, which is then attracted fat, okay, and that fat has lined that blood vessel and gotten thicker and thicker and thicker, and guess what can eventually happen? You have a little clot that forms, and that clot's just big enough to plug up that hole, okay, and then what happens? You don't have any blood supply past that area, okay, so this is a brief little um, review about that, but we will really get into that when we talk about cardiovascular and vessels. We have a whole section about vessels. Okay, so tissue vulnerability to injury. Different tissues are more prone to specific injuries. Okay, ischemia. So lack of blood supply, we're going to see this a lot in the brain and also in the heart is going to cause a lot of damage, okay, with the ischemia um, because of the blockage, because the vessels are small, and because they're highly metabolic, these tissues, so they're going to use a lot of glucose and a lot of oxygen. Now, one of the physiological processes that I want to point out to you that's very important, and this is going to make sense once I explain it, is our body will undergo a process called glucose sparing. If our levels of glucose get low, so think about your patients, their levels of glucose get low, 
was one of the first things to manifest with them. Do they function normally mentally? Absolutely not. That brain is metabolic, okay? Your body will switch the other organs over to fat burning before they will take glucose away from the brain. So if that patient's getting to the point where they are not functional, they're pretty low. They're pretty low, okay? So prolonged lack of blood supply to the brain or also to the heart is gonna cause necrosis, okay? What's happening here? Just to give you an example of that, what are we looking at here? Looking at the brain, okay? If you look at the top of that picture, you can actually see the extraocular eye muscles, okay? So we're looking at the brain, so I think it's a CAT scan of the brain. What about in the center? What are those like spider leg looking things? The blood vessels, yes. Does the right look the same as the left? No, the, we're looking at blood clot here, aren't we? Okay, so this is gonna be blocking out the blood supply to the left side, okay? Could be the right, couldn't it? Depending on how you look at it, but don't worry about that. Okay, so intoxication, certain chemicals we talked about this for, such as um, carbon tetrachloride is an example. Now, what I wanna talk to you about taking it to the next level with intoxication though, is in the book uses carbon tetrachloride as an example. This is a chemical that they used to use in cleaning. They used to use it in um, multiple areas in, um, help me out here, fire extinguishers, okay? And it was pulled off the market because if you inhale too much of it, it will actually get into your blood system and go to the liver. And it damages the liver and I believe it also can damage the kidneys. Well, so if it's so damaging to the liver and the kidneys, why when you inhale it, doesn't it go everywhere and affect all the cells? Oh, somebody just said it. The, the selectivity of the, the receptors, okay? The selectivity of the receptors. For some reason, those liver cells have receptors that will take that carbon tetrachloride, break it down, and it becomes toxic to them. Okay, there's an affinity there, okay? So then intoxication, it can be systemic, right? There are some substances that can be systemic, but there are also some substances that can be specific to certain cells, okay? So this is normal hepatocytes. This is a little um, section of liver, okay? They have nice, healthy pink cells. There are multiples of them. They're pretty small with a nice purple nucleus, mush, mush, mush all together. And if we look at the next slide, what can happen with that carbon tetrachloride is that it'll attach itself to the hepatocytes and cause fatty change. Those expansile bubble-like lesions in there are depositions of fat. Of those, It's showing those cells turning over into fat, okay? And fat, when it infiltrates, excuse me, a cell this much will start to expand and it pushes all the organelles to the side. Now, do you think that that cell is gonna function normally now? Absolutely not, okay? So it's very damaging. <clears throat> excuse me. Ionizing radiation, we talked about this, right? Okay, damaging to, and it's especially divide, um, to dividing cells. That's why when you go, they put the shield where? if you're getting an x-ray over the reproductive organs because they are, especially in males, right, producing millions of sperm every day and you could cause damage to those high turnover of cells. GI tract, okay, has a high rate of replication. Just think about all the abrasion and think about all the substances that abrade the inside lining of the GI tract, right, in your skin. Okay, very prone to damage with ionizing radiation. That's why we put sunblock on. Okay, so ionizing radiation. I just put a little clip in there for you to read through on your own. The radi about the radiation therapy, which we're probably all familiar with, but how that's different from ionizing radiation. Okay, some of the damage to the skin. The skin, excuse me, with that ionizing radiation. Okay, viral infection, we talked about this, right? Those cell surface receptor. The example that the book gives is polio affecting only the front part of the cord. Now, do you remember the front part of the cord controls motor? The back part of the cord does what? Sensory, very good. Okay, we'll go over that in the future. Okay, so viral infection. 
determining or monitoring cell injury. Am I going too fast? We only have like five minutes left. I want to make sure I finish this. Are we okay? Okay. We'll pause for questions at the end. So determination of monitoring cell injury. Okay. So functional loss. Functional loss can be a gross testing of a loss. Loss of range of motion, loss of MRSs, which is what motor reflex, sensory, okay, things like that. But functional loss can also be um, blood tests, okay? Showing a change that's happening, monitoring what's happening in that body, okay? Um, potassium cells are primarily located on the inside of cells. So if cells get damaged, we can have high levels of potassium. This is seen in hemolysis, okay? So if you, God forbid, have the wrong blood transfused, there would be high levels of potassium because those red blood cells are breaking open and that potassium is going into the serum, okay? Creatine phos phosphokinase, antroponin released from heart cells, enzymes from the liver. Are, are we okay with this? This is all kind of, okay, good. Electrical activity, ECGs, electrocardiogram, EEGs, electroencephalograms, EMG is what? Electromyograms, okay? This is going to monitor the movement of electrons across cell membranes, okay? And it helps us to see the function of those three areas, the brain, muscles, excuse me, <coughs> and the heart, okay? So another way to monitor how those structures work. And then a biopsy. Okay, but the one thing that I want to talk to you about, benign versus malignant. And is this it? Oh, yeah, I want to, I want to do that really quick. Why can a benign tumor be dangerous? Why can a benign tumor be dangerous? Absolutely. Benign tumors can be dangerous because they can press on the surrounding structures. Okay? We really don't like expand cell benign tumors in the brain, especially, okay? There's not a whole lot of room there. I think that the space around the brain where cerebral spinal fluid is, is like, gosh, I, I can't tell you the microns, but as thin as like the paper that you use to wrap gifts in, okay? So there is not a lot of room in there. Nerves don't like pressure. So don't forget that benign tumors can cause a problem as well. And of course, malignant we know, because malignant will send cells to different areas and start to replicate, and we'll go through that whole process. Okay? Even if it's benign, can't, isn't there always also the potential, oh, yeah. not only to compress, but also to, to change? To convert, not, absolutely. Because of the compression? Because of the compression because, on it? Well, around the cell and the changes in those cells, So, well, a benign tumor can kick over into malignant, absolutely, unless it's strongly encapsulated. There are some benign tumors that will keep that capsule around them, but they can break out of that capsule and turn benign. So that's going to be one of the major differences. Maybe that's what you're thinking of. Maybe the capsule is what you're thinking of. Okay, good, great question. Now, malignant we know is malignant because it, it can go through the blood. Okay, so we have four minutes. Can we go through this really quick? This should be easy, very easy, right? So Billy Rubin, we're going to see, obviously, in the liver, we're going to see that if there's some sort of damage to the liver, it can't get rid of that bile. CO2, what? Lungs, easy. Potassium, we just talked about that. If what? In the blood. Right, right, if you get a transfusion of the, right, of the wrong one. Creatine phosphokinase, we'll see... Heart, we could also see it with muscle damage, right? As well. Good. Hydrogen ions, remember this one? What? Acidosis. Acidosis, very good. Primarily metabolic, which is going to be seen where? Don't, don't, don't. Kidneys, right? Kidneys, okay. O2, you get that. EEG, brain. Okay, sorry. I know that was really quick. That's easy, but you guys should probably know these things. And if you don't, by all means, come see me. Okay, sorry to rush that last little part. I want to make sure we finished up on time. My people at home, I'm going to check your emails, and I'll respond to them. Are there any questions from people here? Great, excellent. Welcome. Don't forget that we are not going to meet next Wednesday. Okay, please watch the video online.
Um, if you have any problem accessing that, let me know. I'm going to check to make sure that it's still okay. If it's okay, I'll leave the video up that's up there already. Okay. Any questions?